Very good. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thank you so much for asking. I, uh, I thought a few months back, I was like, I, I got to have a paleontologist on. So I started researching paleontologists. Who can I have on? And your name was at the top of the list. And when you responded to my request, mm -hmm. I was super pumped. And I cannot wait for the conversation today. And I want to kind of, for people that might not know, what is a paleontologist? Yeah, sure. A paleontologist, is a, you know, in, in, in brief, is a bone hunter. And actually, in the course of looking for bones, <laughs> I found some human bones. And that's typically in a different subject we call archaeology. If you go back far enough, you end up in this zone in between when we're moving out of our species. And we call that paleoanthropology. But in general, a paleontologist is somebody who studies not just bones, but anything fossil. Mm -hmm. And most of life is not bones. Most of life is shells and trilobites and things I found as a kid. And, um, and it's a very active field. I'm very happy to talk about it because there's a lot of chances uh, for uh, kids in this field. So parents and kids, your listeners, this is a field that keeps giving. And it's, it's unbelievable mm -hmm. uh, how much there is going on in it right now. What was your path to become a paleontologist? Circuitous. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was um, uh, a kid that, like, like many, especially in our cities, but elsewhere as well, um, was not particularly turned on by the four square walls of a room and 30 kids trying to do an exercise at the same time for 40 minutes. I, I, I just didn't, uh, I was too antsy. I was too this, that, whatever. And um, so I was one of those kids who they wanted to hold back. They wanted to flunk a couple of times and I squeaked through because I had incredible parents and I had, I had occasional teachers who were, uh, who were just unbelievable. Ones that I, some of them I feared, but then came to love. And I, mm -hmm. one called me uh, 40 years afterwards. She's 95. She a wavering voice, and she asked me in my office at the University of Chicago, "Do you remember me?" And my name is Arlene Williams, and I said, "My fifth grade teacher." She said, "Are you my Paul Serino?" And I said, um, "Arlene, I could never forget you." She made me Tom Sawyer in the play. We were in the slow reading class. I was in the slow reading class. I wasn't doing very much reading. I was doing so little reading that I needed to read a dictionary actually to get into college. I read a dictionary in my spare time in high school because it was sort of borderline whether I'd get in. And uh, I improved my vocabulary. I remember words that I learned at that point. Collegiate dictionary, cover to cover. Any word I didn't recognize, I wrote down and I would go over the list and I improved my score and I got into college and I, and I, and I, I had a clean slate. But that, my, my story is inspiring for a lot of kids because um, you know, I found myself in art, not paleontology. I didn't really understand what science was about, even in college when I started getting good grades. Um, I didn't really understand what it was about until I was standing in a museum, turned on by the adventure and just unbelievable nature of making discoveries that I understood that science is more, I call it, I call my kind of science adventure with a purpose. It's more about uh, imagination actually than it is about facts. Now, that may sound very counterintuitive, uh, but in fact, it's actually true. You have to, when I find something in the field, you have to imagine where you could find something. Then when you find something sticking out of the ground, you have to imagine what's in the ground that you can't see. Then after you've found it, you find three of them and you have to imagine what a complete animal looks like. And then you have to imagine where this fits into the tree. Yes, you test everything with facts, but Imagination is central to who we are as human beings. Science is central, therefore, to who we are as human beings. And um, I didn't understand that. I didn't understand yeah. that at all. I came to understand that and came to understand that uh, this, this, thing we, this thing that I do, which involves art, imagination, uh, connecting to people, connecting to kids, is, um, is, is, is my version of science. Mm -hmm. And just like you, I think I was in a very similar boat. I did not enjoy the classroom. You know, I hated looking at a book to read, you know, whatever it was, but I found other ways to get through school. And a lot of that was through sport. And you mentioned discoveries and I can think about, and we'll get to this later, but you're an explorer. 
at explorer at Na- national geographic like that that is amazing to me and i think as a kid to think you can grow up to be an explorer is is really motivating and do you remember what was your first discovery well you know just on that theme um <clears throat> i think we are actually uh explorers natively um we are the only species in the history of the world to colonize the world. Uh, and, and the way we did that, and we did it very rapidly. When we came out the last time, when we came out of Africa, tried a couple of times, it didn't, didn't work. And then the last time we came out with the right combination of language and tools, and it, it, it took a mere few thousands of years for us to move. Now, what that is, is what is behind that next hill? I gotta see. What is up that river? I, I, I want to see. We're born explorers. There's only that's the only way you could explain how we could go so far in so so limited amount of time. Um, so we're very different. That's part of who we are. Um, I I told you my my fifth grade teacher made me Tom Sawyer, and, and it was Huck Finn. I remember the few books I did read. I mean, I, I grew up in Chicago, out the suburb. Uh, my dream was to go down the DuPage River, get to the Illinois River, go to the Mississippi, and live and get on a boat, just like Huck Finn. It was, I wanted I wanted that experience. I worked on a farm with my grandfather, an Italian grandfather. Uh, I learned my science out of school. It's what we call technically informal science. It's actually what we do, we now realize most of our lives. The, the, the part that you and I didn't really connect with very well. I love teachers, I love school, we need it. We want to start it even earlier, but that's actually a small component of our experience in terms of humans and what we learn in life. Mm -hmm. And this informal component, which actually is even when we're in school, as much or more of our daily life, is being discovered as as an incredible way to engage in science. So I collected toads, I collected leaves, I learned (laughs) my love for nature in informal time. I did it all informally. Then I found myself, you found yourself in sports. I found myself in art. Uh, I had an art teacher mother, unbelievable uh, artist herself. And all of a sudden I sat there and I remember the turning point, uh, high school, sophomore year, I did a painting on a piece of paper, but it was of a French horn and something. And I, I, I just couldn't believe that I did that. I've set it across the room and I looked at it and I said, I did that with these hands. What else could I do? And I was off to the races. It was pretty much, um, you know, we look back and sometimes we rewrite history. So you gotta be wary of that, but it was pretty much a turning point. I was able, I couldn't turn everything around, uh, but I I began right at that point. I realized it's in me. And that's what I try to bring to kids. When I go into the neighborhoods just outside the university and I see these kids that are bouncing up with all this creative energy and, it looks like they're not going anywhere fast. And, but you can easily see how you could funnel that. And I've done it over and over again. In fact, we won you know, a presidential award from Obama for changing graduation rate from 50% to 95%. How do we do it? Out of school time. Wow. Just get a kid, get them interested in the project. It's very different when you're interested in your own project on your own time in a space that's exciting and different you know, the game, the rules are, the rules have changed mm-hmm. and someone knows your name and that is not your teacher, but someone who you voluntarily go because it's fun and uh, is looking out for what you might do next. That's all it takes. And that's a great point. Like you're doing it for yourself. You're not really doing it for the it's about self-realization. Yeah. yeah. You're curious about whatever the topic or whatever project you're working on. Exactly. And, you know, it, it's really this aspect. Uh, we're not inculcating them, kids, that we're, we're just getting them engaged and mm-hmm. letting them self-realize. Here's something else. I hated writing because I did no reading. Mm-hmm. When you can't, don't do any reading, it's very difficult to write. <laughs> Even in college, I hated it. I'm now, I'm one of the few scientists who've written several National Geographic stories. To write a National Geographic story, it's a very particular thing. Um, I've written scientific papers. I love writing. I love writing now. I'm writing a kid's book. Okay. Um, 
that is one thing that I discovered about myself that I hated that I now love. Mm -hmm. I, I, I bet if you live a full life, you will have a smattering of these things. And the, th the tragedy about life mm -hmm. is that at varying times, you might discover something that you were not good at before that you are now very good at. Mm -hmm. In addition to things that you'll never discover because you never tried. I mean, I have students that come into my lab and I say, well, Dr. Sreen, I know you're an artist. And you make these drawings. I, I can't draw. You, I mean, you put a gun to my head, I can't draw. I said, well, we, have, you, have you tried? Well, their attempts are, are, are minimal at best. They have essentially not explored that dimension of their mind and their body. They haven't. And so there's a lot of things like that. And so the travesty of life is, is not so much um, that we can't accomplish what we want to accomplish. We don't even know what we could have done in another life. You asked me about my life and I said it was securitous. It was. <laughs> I discovered paleontology because I was trailing my brother, who was a polyglot scientist, who was brilliant, applied in all these different fields. I said, you're not interested. In, I, could, I could possibly be interested in paleontology. You're not interested. In, why are you going to the American Museum? I'm going to come along with. And so that's how I, I, I just was hit over the head. I was going to go to maybe be a, a, a studio artist. Then when I got to the American Museum, I couldn't figure out how to connect what I was doing, it was exciting. It was everything I dreamed, but I couldn't see how it would change the world, how it could connect to anybody else. I could describe a new species and who would care. And then I traveled around the world as part of my dissertation. I realized this discipline is gonna teach me more about the world. Mm -hmm. And I am gonna be able to do more with this than anything else I could possibly imagine. Study politics? No, I'm gonna take paleontology. <laughs> And create some beautiful things, and you know, and it it, it it's it was slow, but it connected me, and and then has kept me engaged in the field because everybody loves their history, their deep history, their 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 family history. It's, mm -hmm. it's part of who we are. Yeah, exactly we, right. I, I you know I described us as explorers. We're the only species that actually appreciate the fourth dimension of time. The only one. Wow. Do you do you remember the first? exploration you went on or the one where you found your first dinosaur fossils or that discovery? Sure. You know, um, eventually I will sit down to write uh, some of these stories up because uh, they're, they are rather jaw dropping some of them. Um, four or five times a month, you know, some people would say, um, you have, Serena, you have this thing, you found uh, dinosaurs in every, <laughs> every continent except Antarctica, you know, it's a, you're right and left, we're going to name there's 20 or 30 that I have to name before <laughs> I set things down that I've got already. And there's more in Africa we're going to dig up. For me, I just go out in the field and it's almost like dinosaurs come out to greet you. That It's not that hard. Um, but there are times, four or five times, when you say, this is just impossible. And so you asked me about the first time I found a fossil. Uh, the first time I found a dinosaur. First time I found a fossil. And those stories... Are, are, are just hard to believe. So I decided, I got a job at the University of Chicago. I decided, listen, if I can't get a job in paleontology, I'll go back to art. But I had two jobs and one of them was back in Chicago, my old haunt. And they said, listen, we normally don't hire graduate students, but you look, uh, you know, sort of interesting, odd, <laughs> interesting. So they hired me and straight out of grad school. And I was like, okay, uh, I guess I could lead expeditions, but I never had Expedition 101. So a lot of things that your readers and listeners and kids are going to learn is that the things you end up doing, probably what you're doing right now as a podcaster, uh, guess what? You never took a course, Podcasting 101. Nope. You learned how to do it. You need to learn how to do it. If there's a course, learn how to do it 101, I recommend it because that's what you have to do. And so I'm here at the University of Chicago. I don't know um, how to lead an expedition, except I'm going to lead one. So I said, listen, I'm going to study dinosaurs. I might as well start at the beginning and go for the oldest dinosaur. Since so few had been found, no one had found a skull or a skeleton. That's what I'm going to go for. Where would I go? Well, I looked around and one of my heroes in the field was Alfred Sherwood Romer. And uh, there were others. And he had found this fossil valley that is legendary and Patagon, northern edge of Patagonia in Argentina. Yeah, well, I didn't know Spanish, but I could, you know, I, I could learn. 
And I never saw the place, but hey, I think I can find an early dinosaur there. He found pieces, I'll find the rest. And so I put together a grant. They gave me a pittance, not enough to really run an expedition, but I said, but very fortunately, and this would have, you know, luck would have it. Argentina, it periodically does this. The economy tanked. All of a sudden, my dollars were worth three times what they were when I was planning the expedition. <laughs> I went down there, changed money on the black rock. I had enough to do the expedition. I went out to this place. Again, very limited Spanish. I ran into some young Argentinians. We, we are friends for life. Uh, they didn't know very much English. We didn't know very much Spanish. There was one girl could speak both. And we went out with meager amount of money. We actually went to a butcher shop. The cheapest way, no refrigeration, cheapest way to handle protein out in the field was to actually take a side of the rib cage of a cow and just strip it with a saw, band saw, into strips. So it was like little strips of bone, mm -hmm. muscle, bone, muscle, and you just hang it in the trees. And I remember there was a there was a South American paleontologist who apparently went up to one of his students who was one of my team members. I was young. This was impossible that we would find anything. And he gave him the sign of the cross and he said, may God be with you. And we went out with this, this smoking car 300 miles into a desert we had never seen before, had no wow. maps. And I walked up to the first complete dinosaur skeleton and skull two and a half weeks later. Now, how did it happen? I looked over on one of our prospecting missions. I saw a little triangle. I call it my Bermuda Triangle. I didn't see any footprints in there. We had no time. We had to move the camp. I moved the camp and a Sunday came and I said, listen, we've been working so hard, but anybody that wants to come on our first day off, I'm gonna go. Well, about <laughs> half the team came. And we drove down to this little Bermuda Triangle and I got out of the car and I walked up to the most complete skull of an early dinosaur I ever found. This was a rare source and skeleton. And I screamed and, 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 and the team members said, either he just fell off a cliff, there were plenty of those, or he found it. <laughs> and they all came around. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I broke down, I couldn't, you know, we said we were gonna go out and find this. Two and a half weeks later, I'm standing in front of it. Uh, you know, Discovery Magazine discovered me, they're tripping over history. Th these are the kinds of stories that, uh, you know, you live for. Uh, but there are several of those where, you know, it's just incomprehensible. Uh, you go 1500 miles and you're just standing in front of something that you said you could find. But most of it is, um, I, I want to leave this idea with you for further conversation, that the biggest discoveries that you will make in a career, and including the ones that I think that I've made, are not like that. They're not where you say, I'm looking for something, and then you find it. Mm -hmm. They're actually, you're looking for something, and you find something else. And you say, I wasn't expecting that. Well, but I'm curious. And that's, so I found the largest archaeological site in the center of the Sahara. I changed it to an archaeologist for about 10 years. I mean, I had to pick it up. I taught human anatomy. It wasn't hard. I've collected 100 humans now. They're all pre-Egyptian. We're going after the genome of these people. I could have walked over that skeleton and said, oh, I'm here for dinosaurs. What Human bones? I'm not interested. Um, another colleague, long since gone here at the University of Chicago, was looking at the stars. And he noticed they were all moving away. Big Bang. He discovered that he wasn't looking for it. He was, he was looking for something else. And if you go back to the, some of the biggest discoveries in science, we're curious minds that we're looking for something else. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be aware of that, I think, in your life. You hoped not to look past something that might be much bigger than what you were looking for. With... Um... I mean, that's such a great mindset. I think even in anybody's life, right? Anything you're doing in life, a lot of times, if you're just curious about what you happen to read or who you bump into or their life story, and that's honestly why I do this podcast, just because I'm curious. I've talked to people I never would have dreamed I would have talked to, and I've learned what I can about their field. But I want to go back to your first discovery. How old was that head you found that's the other thing of course 
we have to find out how, how old that was and I found. And we have to do, to do that, I had to do something else that had never been done, which was to date mm -hmm. the first dinosaur. Uh, to do that, we use what we call clocks in the rocks. So they're radioactive materials that are ticking away at the right rate so that they've only partially changed. Carbon is good for humans for the 40,000, 50, 60,000 years. But after about 80,000 years, it's so changed that there's in the carbon that you inhale that uh, it's not good beyond that. And you have to use another isotope of a chemical of an atom that is ticking slower. Now for dinosaurs, there's various things we've used, but the best thing is argon gas because it's a gas that comes out of a volcano, gets trapped. It's a noble gas. It doesn't react with anything. It gets trapped in the crystals of a volcano that erupts, falls into the ash. If you get one of those crystals, you can put it in a laser, vaporize it, pass it by a mass spectrometer and say, how much argon is argon 40 and how much is argon 39? Damn. And you can then age because it formed in that volcano. You can age the sediment and age a fossil that's next to it. We had to find an ash. And so we crawled across this valley, literally chewed our way across. You crawl, you scrape, you look at the layers, and boom, we found an ash bed. I didn't even know what an ash bed looked like, but I brought a student from the University of Chicago. He made his name of science paper. We dated it. We dated it. So we've recalibrated. It's 230 million years ago, plus or minus, you know, a few 100,000 years, 230 mm -hmm. million years ago, we dated dinosaur origins that is in, that is crazy to think about like life on earth 200 plus million years ago when is the what is the oldest fossil ever found well uh what we now know and we've known this outline pretty quickly but we've you know the fossil record beautiful thing about the fossil record uh, i was telling you early on and your your listeners and you know it, it keeps giving. We are naming dinosaurs at a speed today that is faster than at any time in the history of paleontology. Now, it can't last forever. Uh, there'll be enough pulserinos in your audience to go out and find dinosaurs where eventually you're only going to be able to find something that was found before. But I take it that that's probably a century off. So go into the field is my advice. Um, the fossil record keeps on giving because more people know about fossils and because the pockets that you talk about, where was the first fossil found? Where's the first dinosaur found? They're <laughs> here and there. It's a, it's a patchwork. And so you, and, and, it's and it's revealed very slowly. And so the first fossils, what we now know is that Earth cooled off about 4.5, 4.6 billion years ago. And shortly after that, the sediment cycles and the protocontinent started to form and sediments started being laid down. As soon as you had sediment or rock that's made out of particles being laid down, we begin to see signs of life. And some of those earliest fossils come from not too far from where I am right now. Wow. So there's a famous chert. It's like a very fine quartz rock that has what look like to be cells in it. And they're pretty surely cells. And so we see first bacteria-like things, and then we see eukaryotic cells, cells that have nuclei inside appearing. And for a long time, life is very simple like that. And then we see the big jump where we see multicellular animals and there's famous sites. Again, not so far, British Columbia, now they got one in China to piece together the, ex the explosion of life, what we call the Cambrian explosion, where all the phyla we know about today were created the phyla being the biggest categories. So you have like arthropods and there's some in between that we just like, we don't know what these things are. And these are and just Illinois like is named, Yeah, they're animals. And uh, Illinois is named after a very famous Tully monster, which is found not for it. In fact, that was where I went as a kid. A neighbor took me on a fossil hunt to a coal mine south of Chicago. They quarrying limestone there. But in between, there was this mud rock and it has this fauna and it has this weird soft bodied animals about this long with a schnoz, some teeth at the end of it. It looks sort of like a gel. It looks like a, a squid of sorts. You know, it's just weird. 
and it's taken them forever to figure out what this thing is related to. It's related to us very distantly. But this is what the fossil record is. It's an amazing potpourri of discoveries. Wow. What is Argentina uh, like one of the hotbeds for fossils? I was reading some articles earlier today and it, it seemed like Argentina now, you know, was a focus. We are, we are very uh, blessed in this country to have incredible dinosaur beds. They go from, our, uh, actually from Canada all the way through North America because we have this Rockies mountain range that was building at the right time when the dinosaurs were alive, covering them up. And, and now it's, it's still exposed. And, and therefore we have deserts and badlands full cool. of dinosaur fossils, all the way down to Mexico, down to Baja, Mexico. And then it picks up again in South America in Patagonia. But North America has a broader expanse than Patagonia. And so there's more dinosaurs in North America. And China is equally rich because it had volcanoes and little, you need to be, bury the animals and then they need to be exposed. There's two things to get, to get dinosaurs. If you bury them and they're, they're not exposed at the surface at all, there's nothing you can do. If they bury them and they're, and they're also in a desert because you got to be able to see them, then that's perfect. And that's the, the condition they had in China and they had these lakes and they got feathered dinosaurs. Unbelievable. You know, so there's dinosaurs everywhere in Australia. Now, I'm attracted to the Sahara in Africa because I'm magnetically attracted to it because it breathes, it, it shouts adventure. There's no road that crosses the Sahara North South. You wanna go someplace where no one's been? How about there? There are entire <laughs> areas. The size, my, my field area is a couple times the size of Illinois. Um, I go to places where nobody has been. What? And, what? I, and, and I am guaranteed of finding something new. I can't dig up something that has been found before. I like that. What, but what's the start to find out where to go? I mean, like you just said, your current, what you're currently working on now, it's as big as Illinois. Where, like, where do you, hey, I'm going to go over here. And do you have technology? Do you have machines? Do you have ways to like look through yeah, the- So the, the technology of, of uh, finding things, um, it's not so much the technology of finding things that's still largely grit. Uh, and going out there with the best legs and, and, and minds you can physically. And it's always fun. Uh, I have this, I call it this uh, paleo power. It's my workout. Um, it's a 60 minute workout. I give any undergraduate credit that can do it in 60 minutes. So far, no one's got full credit. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it keeps you in shape because after I've gotten towards my paleozoic, I was born in the paleozoic and I'm, I'm getting up there. I can't just decide to go to the Sahara tomorrow and expect that I'm not going to be flat on my back if I'm not prepared. So I, I, I do keep prepared uh, so I can keep up with the youngsters or even push them. Uh, but where do you go? So there's a long history of paleontology. It's about 200 years. It started in England when uh, the first bone was described. You know, native peoples and in through time, our ancestors have been picking up fossil wood and so on. It's not really the beginning, of, but the first recorded in a book drawing of a fossil is uh, just a couple hundred years ago. And so when we understood what a fossil was, less, 150 years. You know, uh, Darwin said they're very old. We had no real good way to date them at that time, and he turned out to be right. And um, so we begin to piece this to, together. And then there's the, ex the true explorers who went across Africa when uh, you had to use camel. And, uh, and then you get to the, the, the modern explorers and, who have written some papers. And then you get to yesterday and, and it's all searchable now. So you get on Google and you search, you get geology maps to see where the, the earth has gotten smaller every year. Okay. So oh. The geologists have gone in to map those data, the map those rocks to see how old they are. You're going to find dinosaurs in dinosaur era rock. That's why we can't find any dinosaurs in Illinois. There's only one little slice I've been to it down in Cairo, Cairo, Illinois at the tip. And it's marine rock. So you'd have to get a floater. Uh, a leaf has been found there. Now, the chance of getting a dinosaur is essentially zero. You get a mastodon, you can get a trilobite, you can get a tully monster, but no dinosaurs. So you got to figure out where the rocks are then you look up anything and everything else that anybody has found, and then you make a plan. Dang. And you try and go where things have been found and where things haven't been found. Dang, that is nuts. And 
like you said, you want to go mainly probably in places people have never been. Yeah. And uh, we found such a place last time I was out in the desert. I, I actually, there was somebody that went there tangentially. It was a geologist. And he said, you know, this was a, like the 50s. Literally the last time anybody who had recorded going to this part of the Sahara. And he said, you know what? I found the site and I uh, found these dagger-like teeth. I knew he was describing a predator like this. Yeah. What uh, head is that? Th this is Delta Dromius. I found this dinosaur in Morocco. Um, this is a cast of the, of, the, of the head. Only the teeth were bigger, but no illustrations. The specimens were not ever put in a museum. It was just this little passage that told me I got to go to this place. I don't know what's out there, but it's clear it's dinosaur age rock and it's river rock to preserve that. So it took us a big struggle to get out there because there was a huge sand sea about the size of Illinois in the between. And we managed to get around it and get out there. And we found, I think, the site that he was talking about. Now you say, uh, you asked me about equipment and tech. And, and yeah, sure. Now we have GPS. So you can find your, you know exactly where you are when you're in trouble. You can even call out. You can call mom on a sat phone. Uh, you, you can even hot like if you got enough money. Uh, but um, still, finding the dinosaur is grit. It's, it's going there. So we got there. We He didn't have a GPS. So we think we found his site and we found the fossils when we found those dagger teeth. And then we moved on. We listened to the locals who know the desert. They said they know of a place where there's, there's, there's big bones. Well, what color are they? Well, they're, they're black. I said, black? Describe them to me. This is through several languages. And, just, <laughs> and I said, you know, that sounds really interesting. Let's go. And this guy gets on a moped and he's going for hours. And we are trying to keep up in the open desert. I'm saying, is this a wild goose chase? Where are we? We're just watching. And we are a day and a half into this. And then he drives up and there it is. And OMG dinosaur and another one and then we find it's a whole new area wow. and that's how you make discoveries you i change plans you have to be strategic now another person in that spot may not have made that discovery they might have said this sounds like a wild goose chase or sorry i'm going back to where that other scientist was and i'm going to look more there because i mean at least we we found some dinosaur bones but th those are strategic decisions in the field but a whole new area very remote Brand new dinosaurs. We found a spinosaur there, never been described. Exciting. Yeah. Wow. How many species of dinosaurs have been discovered? So we're probably up to, we, we tend to think of genera when we get back that way, which is the second or the first name, like Homo sapiens, about mm -hmm. 500 species, uh, probably close, closing in a thousand. Wow. And, um, and we're, you know, we're, we're naming them at a, at a fast rate um, because there's more paleontologists today. And even in the Sahara, people know what a dinosaur was. When I first went there 30 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, I went to the center of the Sahara and I showed people a picture of a reconstructed dinosaur. And they asked me where this is alive, where? They were quite reasonably, they, they thought it might be alive somewhere. <laughs> And um, this is how we were early on when we found fossils in Europe. We thought that we had to prove extinction. No one, no one believed that things ever went extinct. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so then I showed Jurassic Park in Agadez, the crossroads of the desert. That was uh, <laughs> years ago. And the world's gotten smaller ever since. Everybody has cell phones and, and uh, everybody knows. Ranchers know. Everybody knows. Uh, nomads know. They know what fossils mm -hmm. are. And... Uh, you, 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 you learn about things that you otherwise wouldn't learn about. What was the cause of extinction? Well, there's many causes. And of course, our own species, we found tons of new evidence of our own species and the uh, sister species that live near us. And of course, there's a whole field of nanopaleontology now where we look for getting genomes. I'm looking at getting the genome out of this human population that is older than the Egyptians, mm -hmm. 10,000 years. We have certain bones that we go to to try and get those remnant uh, DNA molecules. And so there's a whole field of nanopaleontology where you're, you're trying to understand all sorts of things like how long were the dinosaurs brooding on their egg? Now, things that we could 
never imagine um, the color of dinosaurs, you know, and then as you get to less than a million years, maybe we get the genome. You can get scales and other things. We got we got dinosaur toenails for the first time, not announced yet. I mean, it, it's just um, there's a whole subfield of of nano paleontology that's fascinating. But um, you, you you know, uh, so you know the field is 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 in fact uh, you know very alive. New tax has only one side of the picture: understanding mm -hmm. evolution, dinosaur biology or the other kinds of animals, and you asked about extinction. Well, it's multi-causal, but the main reason is that nothing ever stays the same. We talk about climate change and yes, we're influencing it ourselves. There's no question mm -hmm. about that. And it's frightening because it is the motor of extinction. And we see how it's disrupting our lives in real time. The drying of the West. Actually, Chicago is supposed to get wetter. Um, these things disrupt everything sea level changes, mm -hmm. um, the, the desert Sahara, the people that were living there were living this unbelievable life in the middle of the Sahara where they were hunting crocodiles and elephants. They made bracelets out of elephants. Elephants were in the center of Sahara 10,000 wow. years ago. And so we now have mastered tools with language. We're the only uh, species with language. And, um, we have mastered tools, and then we have this very strange and unique combination, which I consider to be uh, as accidental as my own life. I think in a, if you ran the tape again, I wouldn't be a paleontologist, I'd be doing something else. Maybe be an artist, I'd, I'd be doing something else. Or maybe I wouldn't amount to anything, who knows? No, um, you're too curious. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but you know, if there's a hubris, there's a, there's a real sense of respect, an incorrigible sense of humility that you have when you have found yourself out of nothing. I often say, you know, the biggest asset I have in life was early failure because you appreciate uh, the actions necessary and decisions to succeed. It's up to you. You really are the master of your own universe and you really appreciate that rather than think, oh my God, you know, I'm so talented and this and that, I've done so many things, done this. No, you really appreciate that you are uh, in large measure, there's a lot of things that can happen, good luck, bad luck, but in the end, you are what you make yourself to be. And, and, and the sad thing, as I said, you're not gonna discover even half of what you could do, mm -hmm. but a good life is that you've discovered a few other things. And um, so anyway, uh, but uh, you know, uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, I, th I think that I was describing human history and if you look, okay, we have language, but th there's a couple of other things that give us this ultimate power to dominate the world as we have and ultimately destroy it. We eat everything. How many other species do that? Bears, pigs, you, very few, because when you eat everything, you're good at eating nothing. We, we leave food value, enormous food value behind mm -hmm. the flies, find it right away. It's, yeah. it's very rich. We don't digest very well. We can't digest plants very well. We just grab a few vitamins. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're good at eating everything. It was just a very unusual combination that this animal that was, that was actually, we were carnivores at one point, and some of us were even herbivores, is a very odd combination in human history. And then we, we adapted, and most of us can drink milk now as adults and so on. But we are this unusual species and a typical party. I, I just got married and had a beautiful party. And um, congrats. Thank you. And <laughs> we ate everything. We ate everything. There were shrimp, there was plants, there was me. Yeah. So this is the sad thing because we're eat, we can eat ourselves out of existence. We eat everything. And the, had we been herbivores, it would have been a different story. You know, we probably would have been a, a totally different kind of species. But, you know, so we walk in a strange way on two legs. Dinosaurs did that first. We have opposable thumbs, which allow us to grab. Dinosaurs did that first. They did it with their toes. They did it with their hands. There's nothing we did first except language. It's the only thing. It was a changing factor. And we are the lone survivors of a lineage that created like a bush. There was three or four species around at all times until mm -hmm. the very end when there was only one. And you ask about extinction is where we got started on this little, sure. this little journey. And 
we almost went extinct. That's why we're so similar. When I take your genome compared to mine or to my wife from Thailand, we are so similar yep. that our genetic diversity is far less than the populations of chimpanzees in Africa. And that tells us that we, we emerged 200,000 years ago. And yeah, we have slight uh, differences, skin color and so on that, that you can accrue pretty quickly, but we're extremely similar. With the extinction of dinosaurs, was it mainly climate change? Was it mainly? I think it's pretty subtle. Or... And there's just a new paper out on the timing of it. It's pretty subtle that it was an asteroid. And it probably struck in the spring of that year, about 66 and a half, uh, and a half million years ago, 65, 66 million years ago, probably in, 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 in Chicxulub in, in, uh, in Central America. And think of the chance of this. OK, it hit. Uh, and then there's pretty good evidence for this. It hit. On a place where I've gone diving, I love diving. It's a totally different world from paleontology. In my spare time, so I'm a certified wreck diver, and I was attracted down to the Yucatan Peninsula because they have these cenotes, these caves, and you have to take a rope in there. A little <laughs> bit challenging. I love it. I, it's a wholly different world. Now that is limestone caverns underwater because the water, the, the ice melted and the water's up, and that's where the Chicxulub crater is. That's where the the, the killer dinosaur asteroid hit. Now. As you know from your geography that about seven eighths of the world or three quarters of the world, a little bit more, is ocean water. Mm -hmm. Now had it hit just a little bit away instead of on the edge of land, the chances of it hitting there were pretty minor. Yeah. Certainly one out of four, but it did. And that created a carbon rich aftermath that was killing. Had it hit in the ocean, gone through 10,000 feet of water, then hit basalt on the bottom of the ocean, the dinosaurs would still be here. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. Is, there, is there a animal now that is similar to dinosaurs? You always think about crocodiles or alligators, things yeah, of that nature. but that's because we are limited in what we understand evolution can do. We look at things overall and we say a crocodile and alligator is closer to what we imagine a dinosaur to be like but if you could transport yourself back to the dinosaur era especially towards the end of the dinosaur era you would be shocked and you would be terribly shocked because everything that you could name me about a bird i've asked my daughter this one tell me what a bird is well let's see it perches it nests it gives lays big <laughs> eggs it's warm it's got feathers yeah, every single thing that it incubated every single thing that you could tell me about a bird wow. evolved in dinosaurs before they took going. flight. Yeah, so uh, birds are with us. And I built a giant bird cage because I have to get closer to the living dinosaurs. They are dinosaurs technically in the sense that we name groups on everything that descended because it went and looks bizarre because a lot of things went extinct. Doesn't change the fact that they're descendants. I mean, you would like to be called the descendant of your parents, right? You know, we, just because you look different, you've got a beard and you do podcasts. We don't call you a new group and your parents are over there. But that's, you know, so birds are dinosaurs. They inherited dinosaur biology. If I want to get to understand dinosaurs a little more closely, I better get a couple of these living ones as pets. And that's what I plan to do. Very cool. And you mentioned this, and I didn't know this about you, but you're a diver. And I was talking to a buddy of mine before coming on, and he mentioned about how, you know, 80% of the world's oceans might be undiscovered. How much potential is in water-based species of dinosaurs? Or has that been explored by paleontologists? Well, no, you know, so one of the great mysteries, and uh, I'm writing about it right now, is why dinosaurs proper, not birds, they're dinosaur descendants. And they certainly are adapted to, we have to admit that the dinosaurs in this technical sense did not go extinct. They're with us 10,000 species from pole to pole. They outstrip mammals species wise. There's 10,000 of them, there's only 5,000 mammals. They outstrip mammals in every other way. They're much better flyers. Bats suck by comparison, sorry. Uh, and so dinosaurs still, you know, they win. <laughs> uh, but Having said that, the big ones that we normally associate with dinosaurs, none of them became aquatic, even though they commanded the land for 150 million years. And that's the central question, why? And I think I have the answer. But some of them were semi-aquatic. Spinosaurus was the most aquatic, semi-aquatic of them all. I don't think it was aquatic. I don't think it was 
swimming out in the ocean like a whale. But uh, it is a central question. So we're not going to find dinosaur fossils in the ocean unless they're floaters. Not going to find them. Every Dang, once in a while, an animal carcass floats out. Yeah. No, there's no aquatic dinosaurs uh, until you get to birds. And there's a good reason for that. They have this, they're upright, but they have this big tail and they, they're not good swimmers. Uh, but uh, until you get rid of that tail, then they become swimmers. Same for mammals. Get rid of the tail. And then you can <laughs> modify the tail. We all, even humans, swim up and down like this. Okay. When you go upright on land, like a dog, like a dinosaur, two-legged or four-legged, mm -hmm. you start moving like this, not like a fish. This is the basic. When you go back in the water, you never swim like a fish mm -hmm. unless you never were upright on land. You always swim like this. We swim the butterfly stroke. We can we have all our muscles are now top and bottom, not side to side like on a fish and a tail. Yeah. And so dinosaurs were trapped in this body with a big tail that looked like a fish and a body that was going up and down. And so they, they didn't know what to do when you get into water. And that's why they didn't go into water, in my opinion. So, but anyway, um, you can't find, but if someone happened to crate up some dinosaurs and buy them, and this did happen, and got mixed up in a war, and then that ship was down with that dinosaur and a famous dinosaur on board, and it's in deep water, then that's the dinosaur I'm going after. And wow. so I do have my mission in the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> what is, um, so you're, you're currently, you mentioned right before we came on, you've been, just got back from the Sahara and you're gonna go back soon, I think you said. And is that, are you working on the human civilization you found or yeah. the, you're, so you're still working on the human Doing civilization? Both. Yeah, yeah, and it's really unusual, but I'm doing both. And I'm doing both. I tried to pan off the human thing because, you know, it's a lot to do. Be a paleontologist and our job at the same time. But, you know, hey, I consider myself still an artist. You know, so, um, yeah, I'm working on both. And um, I've, my connection to Niger is now real serious, uh, just like it is my connection to kids. I want to do something outside here in Chicago. I have two big projects um, outside my research, uh, both connected to how I, uh, you know, the first is let's do something outside the university in one of these neighborhoods is looking for direction that takes their kids on a journey with us in science. How, how difficult really is this? I mean, we, it's out of school. This, we want to support the schools, but I'm going to create an out of school heaven in the middle of a neighborhood, not on campus, in the middle of the neighborhood that's their space. It's a kid's space and it's free. And you come there to maker spaces that go way beyond robotics and electronics. Sorry, engineers. I love STEM. <laughs> I love the E in engineering, but it's not the only thing. You know, there's so many other jobs. There's so much more to science. You know, I call my paleontology lab a bone maker space. That's what it is. We work with bones. We build things. And it's fascinating to kids. And they come into that lab and they can learn about science, about techniques that could take them into not just paleontology, forensics, biology. We, we're, we're going after DNA. There's anything you want. So this idea of a makerspace being just electronics and robotics, that's one part of it, but it goes. So I want to do that. And then back in Africa, I have agreements. You have to become an ambassador to be able to move more material out of Africa and then hopefully back in. It's the plan. Mm -hmm. Then all other white people combined. You have to connect with Africa in a way that nobody has before. And I, I feel that I have. On the last trip, I went to Niger. It's the country where I work. And I was given, it was incredibly honorific. I was given the key to the city of mm. Agadez, which is like your brother. I've been there for 25 years, but they understand that I've listened and learned. They are, of course, my eyes of the desert, the reason I survived. But what is in it for them after all these discoveries? Well, they want a museum. And why not? So we designed a zero energy, the most modern museum we could possibly conceive of, beautiful, like an oasis surrounded by water, to take you on a journey to their, their landscape for the population, for people who want to visit. This is the crossroads of the Sahara. There's no museum in the Sahara. Why not? These are, there's all these people. These are the last nomads on the planet. They speak three or four languages. They have music. They have stories. They, I named my first dinosaur after one of their mythic monsters, Jubaria. So now we're joined. I make an agreement with the country, I make an agreement with the locals, but I make a more fundamental agreement with anything I dig up. It, you, you have to imagine 
digging up the most posed burial in prehistory, a woman holding hands with two kids. And some of my excavators crying while we're brushing back the sands of time, 7,000 years old, older than the Egyptians. Wow. Uh, my commitment, my agreement is never, I will not let you get destroyed. I am, I've been invited into your grave. It's even more personal, of course, than the dinosaurs, but the dinosaurs, you find one of a, a new species. I'm going to describe a digging raptor that's going to shake the world. Got a name for it already, but I'm not going to mention it online because there's too many kids listening. <laughs> <laughs> and there's only one of these things. And, and I cannot just return it without a home. We got to mm -hmm. build it. If there's no museum, we got to build one. This is part that comes with the territory. So that's, that's my engagement. Very cool. Do you have any timeline for the museum? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah time is always uh, uh, longer than you want, but shorter. It's got to be short. <laughs> we got a beautiful window in this country of Niger. We have built a, a, a military base there. They have stopped the migration route largely in its tracks. We owe that country. It's one of the poorest, youngest countries in the world. They have Africa's story, pre-Egyptian story. They have the dinosaur story for the continent. And they deserve these museums. And we're going to raise the money with them for these museums. So you go to my website. You look up Niger Heritage. You see it on my website right in the front. Uh, the story you talked about, the pandemic and the dinosaurs, will take you right there. We plan to build these museums in the space of two or three years. How do you spell Niger? N-I-G-E-R. The common language is French. It was a French colony, but there's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different languages. So that's their lingua franca. Got and it. Niger is how we pronounce it. Some people might pronounce cool. it Niger. It's north yes. of Nigeria. Sometimes people confuse it with Nigeria. I've but heard Niger, but, yes. Yeah, it's a beautiful country, half desert, half chocobock full of, of just unbelievable discoveries. And, and it is people's place to go in in better times they had a, they had presidential election they elected a new president it's democratic it's friendly it's Very it's cool. really an unbelievable country i feel like they have a pretty good soccer team too <laughs> yes it's popular <laughs> um all right well this has been an amazing conversation but i got a few questions from my listeners and they're a little sure. bit more fun so we have three of them here and first one if you could be one dinosaur, which one would you pick and why? Well, being a, a discoverer of, of quite a few, my favorite dinosaur and the one I would imagine being is the next one I'm going to name, which would have to be the digging raptor. I mean, uh, this digging is going to be the raptor. digging raptor. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Why? Because it's the coolest. I mean, so what dinosaurs, what the fossil record even of humans allows us to imagine is what could be. And this is actually why your listeners are so fascinated with this. Because by the time you're three, maybe four, your little child can already understand that there's bones inside animals and that this thing, it understands extinction. And they understand that there was a world that existed there that I have to imagine, but was real. That's the difference. It's not GI Joe, it's I, can imagine this and I can learn the names and I can soon learn more names very quickly than my parents. And it's my world and I can love it and live it. And it forces me to imagine. And I told you that imagination was key to being human. It's key to science. Mm -hmm. It's key to being a kid. Uh, we're born with this natural sense of imagination and it takes years to beat it out of us. And those of us who retain it, some of us become podcasters, some of us became, become mm -hmm. paleontologists. And um, so, uh, the, the question was, what would I, I, yeah, the digging raptor, I'm not going to mention the name, I'm tempted. Okay, um, no worries. But, uh, yeah, it's, a, it, it's an animal that, you know, when I described it at the paleontology meeting, th there were people that just had their jaws down because they can't imagine. It's a cross between a rhea, an ostrich-like animal, and a wolverine. It's wow. a two-legged animal that digs. We've never seen anything like it. It digs with its Forms. legs? Forms. It's got, is powerful little forms that just <laughs> and you know you say well i mean how, why did this animal what was it doing it's a predator i think it was digging out lizards and small prey out of their burrows yanking them out and eating them that's what it was doing very cool okay <laughs> second question what is one thing everyone should know about dinosaurs but it's never discussed 
Well, I'll tell you one thing that I'm fascinated with, and they say it'll ruin my career, but I'm going to write the paper anyway, uh, because I think it's going to be one of the most important papers I write. And that is that dinosaurs are our closest evolutionary companions. And I'm including birds with dinosaurs. And it's not, a, it's not a mystery statement, but it hasn't been fully realized or even studied. But they teach us about the trajectory of human evolution because they are, in fact, our closest. Remember I told you, there's not a single thing you can tell me about a human that is unique, that dinosaurs haven't invented major, that, um, that dinosaurs hadn't invented first, except language. Mm -hmm. And I would consider writing an artwork part of language, but even dinosaurs, they construct nests. You can consider some of them artists. They protect blue things and so on. But they made tools. They use their beak. They make tools. They have semi-opposable toes. They have a syrinx that's far more talented than our larynx. And they have vocal learning, which is the, pre the, the predecessor to language. Mm -hmm. And there's no other species of mammals that have vocal learning, which is stunning. Yeah, that we is have stunning. It. Chimps don't have it. Vocal learning is where I learn your name, and then I can say it. It's actually quite complicated. But that's the precursor to language, of course, because mm -hmm. you learn new words and you say them. And many birds have this, hummingbirds, toucans most famously. But, but um, now you, the, the natural question is, why didn't they go one step further and invent language? I mean, they had it for 20 million years. When you look at the history of some of these bird groups, and the answer is evolution doesn't work logically. And uh, <laughs> who would have thought when we were in, using clay tablets to mark I'm going to sell you three chickens and you give me two goats that that would result in a podcast. That is, <laughs> that is the beginning of digital digitization. Who would have thought, what is this that clay tablets crap? You know, a, and look where it led. It literally led the changing of verbal to digital began 5,000 years ago. And so anyway, you can't predict. So why is this radical? Because it shows us that we are just like my life. I describe my life as circuitous. Okay. Mm -hmm. We are a circuitous invention of evolution. A lot of people don't want to believe that, but I believe it. You can, you can mystify it. You can say it's wonderful. It's uh, mystical. It's I do. I think we are living in a moment as we look out now at the universe and we see other earth-like planets and we still don't hear anybody coming. And that confirms that we are unique that we should preserve this world and we should use our, the, the time we have in our life to do something beautiful, to make it a better place. This is our chance. This is, what, this is what our species was built to do. We recognize time. We recognize our moment in history. Let's use it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not gonna be here forever. Your life is not gonna be here forever and we're not gonna be here forever as a species. So why, why are your dinosaurs? Because dinosaurs invented bipedality 250 million years ago, semi-opposable digits, they invented everything that we ever eat, warm-blooded, everything that was that you would say, even particulars of humans, um, they invented it. Yeah. And, and I've never thought where, about look that. Look where it got them. Yeah. There are more species and they're having a good time. <laughs> okay, so there's nothing inevitable about us. There's nothing inevitable about Paul Serino or you. In fact, um, the difference is that we have, and with your show, and your show is devoted to this, is to helping us realize how we can shape our world. We have the chance to shape our world mm -hmm. uh, every day. And uh, we have a chance to do something, create something, do something, make it a little bit better place while we're using up the energy and eating everything. Uh <laughs> oh, I meant to say this earlier. I, I, I learned yesterday, I think 50% of food goes to the wastelands. So we process and make so much food and we only eat about 50 percent of it yeah and that and, and then we don't eat that well we don't yeah we yeah. eat horribly <laughs> yeah we, we 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 take very little advantage yeah no there's a huge amount of waste and you know uh we're, we're slowly beginning to realize these things i hope we realize them fast enough and the new generations always um are quicker but um yeah we're, we're at a very interesting point in history where uh where we either are going to make it or we're not. You know, and one of the final elements I think that makes us human is our ability to survive. We're gonna be tested in that way as a species uh, more severely than we've ever been tested before. Mm -hmm. We were tested before by, by climate and uh, our own changes are making that an issue today. But as you see what's happening in Ukraine, we've got to give us some of these, these very 
these very bad habits. Uh, and we got, we, we got to realize that um, in, in our own country, which is a shame, in our own country, we, uh, we have exacerbated the differences between people in the last four or five years. And what we have to realize is that we're on this planet together. And, um, and it's hurtling through time at a faster rate every day. Mm-hmm. And we better smarten up. Uh, we, we certainly have the mental power to do it. And it, it, it's, it's one of the greatest mysteries of human nature as to with all of this mental power that we have been gifted. I mean, it's superpower, supercomputer power in our brain. Yeah. It's that we amazing. can still believe in QAnon and other kinds of things that are very destructive. You know, this is the mystery of human, human nature. All right. Last question. Will there ever be a Jurassic Park-esque recreation? or anything along those lines? Um, in terms of- In our lifetime, back, maybe. Bringing back these species and things like that, no. I think your best chance, shot at, at re- really experiencing a dinosaur is to raise uh, some, some, some primitive birds, which is what I'm gonna do. <laughs> now, the second best is we're gonna bring a 3D camera, a virtual reality camera in the field. You're gonna be able to visit our dig site. Very cool. Uh, and move around uh, on it. Uh, that aspect of things is really changing. So you're going to be able to experience things. And then we're going to actually, with cameras, I mean, digitally raise the dinosaur up. Everything we can see, grab it digitally. we got drones. We've got stereo photography. Uh, we're going to start putting this dinosaur together before we've even taken it out of the ground. And we're going that to take you on amazing. that journey. So that, that's the closest we're going to get to Jurassic Park. Because, you know, the dig site in Jurassic Park was the most fictitious thing about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As we're, as we're finishing up here and you've been very gracious with your time, all those young kids, all those people very similar to you and me who were just didn't know their direction, right? At young age, going through school, what's your message to them? What's your message to those curious young kids out there? Oh, my message is always, uh, it's in you, you know, it, it, life is about self-realization and it starts out in small ways, get engaged. You don't, you're not engaged in school, get engaged in something out of school. There's, there's no excuse. Uh, there really isn't an excuse because it's up to you. Uh, can't write, not a problem. I couldn't either. Me neither. <laughs> uh, I speak properly, I had a problem too. Uh, I had good parents, so I had some advantages, but so do you. You have your own little advantages and disadvantages here and there. Don't let that stop you. You know, um, uh, it's self-confidence and it comes step by step. And once I got that little nuclear engine behind me. And I remember when it happened, I understood that I could, I could go just about anywhere. I would work hard enough where I would go just about anywhere. And, um, and that's what you gotta, you gotta find, you gotta tap that resource inside. That, and it starts small because people are not given a lot of reason to believe in themselves. And they're not told that you have a golden temple inside your head, inside your heart. You just got to find it and, and activate it. Mm-hmm. They're not really told that. They have no idea. They have no idea how many talents are just under the surface. Yeah. There's... But um, you you got to let it let it grow, and then you got to reinforce it. So, you know, in terms of trajectory for kids, I look at it as three parts. Uh, the first part is getting kids interested in science. That is so easy, it's pathetic. Okay, you just need to set them down in an outside school situation and. And the kid that hates school is in your hands doing things that you can't even believe. And then they're making videos of it to tell their friends and so on. Then the next part is, is staying interested in it. So come back for something more, come back for the next step. And then the final stage is really realizing that you could be a person that does this Mm -hmm. for a living. And once you're there, you're on your way that realization of oh my goodness and there's so many opportunities now probably more opportunities than ever there is so this is the fastest growing part of our economy the technology uh people interpreting cat scans in hospitals inspecting sites uh forensics uh besides being a paleontologist you know and there's even opportunities there because universities are expanding we're more museums today than there ever was before and more interest in paleontology. And so it's one aspect, but there are many technical jobs. Some require PhD, some require master's, some don't even require that. Mm-hmm. A lot require college, but some don't even require that. Mm-hmm. So there's many ways to get involved. 
Very cool. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining me. What's the best way for people to keep in touch with what you're doing? Oh, I got a website and a way to email me through the website. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, I look forward to connecting to more people and, and your podcast is a great way. But, um, you know, through films and, and, and the like, I hope to uh, bring the stories out and books, uh, bring the stories out. But you can find it all on the website. Perfect. And I'll have all that listed in the show notes so people can go right to it. But Paul, man, I know you're super busy. So thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure to have you on. It's been a pleasure to be on. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we're done. How do you feel? You, you did amazing. I mean, 